All right. Hey, I'm, I'm great to be with this rock star lineup. And I really appreciate uh, the fact that we have this time together. And uh, uh, primarily, I, I'm going to call Monavision the not so ugly stepsister of presbyopic correction. Uh, my disclosures are I work for a lot of different companies a lot that we'll talk about, but I'll try and be equal in sharing. So I like to start off with what I want you to learn from my part of the lecture is Monovision is a great option. If you have a patient that's starting with Monovision, whether it's in contact lenses or maybe they had LASIK before, I think you want to think hard before you want to try and improve on that. And we have so many new options. One that Graham's going to talk a little bit more about, I'm going to kind of introduce in just a little bit, uh, that make Monovision easy, even better than it's ever been. So who should have Monovision? Well, first we wanna look at your hobbies and your habits. So that's one of the first questions I ask. And I said, I don't wanna know your job title. I wanna know what you do. Do you sit at a computer? Do you drive a truck? Do you fly an airplane? Do you play golf? Are you really good at it? Are you a 5 tennis player? So I need to know that before I can kind of figure out, you know, if Monovision is gonna be an option for you. So when I did my brother's LASIK, I did Monovision. When I did my sister-in-law's refractive lensectomy, I did Monovision. When I did my mom's, cataract surgery, I did Monovision. And when I had LASIK performed by Mickey Gordon, I had Monovision. So I'm Plano and minus one works exceptionally well for me. And I'll tell you the nuances and the pluses and minuses for me. Now, for some of us, binocularity is somewhat sacrificed. Uh, I was coaching the little 10 year olds baseball team. So when I first came back after LASIK, it took me a little bit to get that uh, depth of focus, depth of field uh, aligned again, but I think it wasn't very long. And I don't play serious golf, but I play a lot of golf and I play, you know, other sports that require a lot of depth perception. I hunt those kind of things. And it really doesn't affect me in the long range, but there are certain people that just can't tolerate monovision. So if you're a four or less handicap on the golf course, I doubt you're going to tolerate that. If you're a 5-0 tennis player, I doubt you're going to tolerate that. And on average, it's about 1.5 diopters that uh, patients will accept. And we've got data to support that that I'm going to show you in a minute. So let's talk about the science for just a second. You know, we've had a lot of studies that, that monovision and pseudophagia performs very well at the 90 to 95% or a plus level. I think that there are a lot of pitfalls. This is a great uh, 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 CRST article that was from Tim Snyder a few years back. Some of the top 10 pitfalls, you know, patient selection is important. Uh, you got to talk about reduced binocular vision. You got to talk maybe for me now, I painted my walls wider and I've got a lot brighter lights in my office. So that helps. Uh, I have not converted to readers yet, but I think patients need to know that they'll probably still use them for certain things. Uh, and you've got to figure out what is their exact amount that they like. And I think, you know, contact lens trials are awesome for that. And if it doesn't work, you've got to think about the process of an enhancement or how are you going to touch that up? Uh, I talk about stereoacuity and depth perception, those people that I think is important, whether it's their hobbies or their habits. Um, you can kind of say maybe it's a higher cost for surgeons, but my current enhancement rate for the group that I'm going to talk about, which is over about two or 3,000 patients, is 1.6%. So I think if you look at higher costs, I don't know if that's a great argument. And then there's compromise with monovision. We discussed that. Uh, this just came out in Nature, and basically, you know, it doesn't really a, a, appreciably alter visual processing, you know, eye movements maybe a little bit are limited on certain arrays, but realistically for the most part, the science is showing that it still works well, uh, you know, all these years later. And, and Dr. Marshall and I are making the comment earlier that this has been around for a long, long time. So it's not something new. And almost every ophthalmologist that we know, he or she will say, what? That I do some sort of monovision, whether it's a mini monovision, that's a true monovision, people defocus all the time. So my personal results and my study start off with uh, a study that Faulkner and I did quite a while ago. We presented to Y and I, and we showed that certain patients prefer their dominant eyes and other patients prefer their non-dominant eye to be the reading eye. Classic example, uh, Michael Marokin's good friend and mine, Kai Kazarian, likes to have his eye that's dominant for near. Now his home office is right next to where he walks around in the kitchen where he walks around in the bedroom. So he really feels like, you know, my dominant eye for my near eye is much better for me. But for the most part, about 73% in our study, the patients preferred their dominant eye for distance and their non-dominant eye for near. But it's really important to figure that out. And one free, easy way to do that is with the contact lens trial. I have 500 physicians that refer into me. 
we talk to them about how they can do a contact lens trial to help me better serve their patients. If I have challenges with them, I have about five uh, optometrists that I specifically refer to that will pretty much nail the, nail the number for me. And when we looked at these numbers, about minus one and a half was pretty much the target for everybody. When you're getting in the minus two and a quarter and two and a half range with a true monovision, we're having some other limitations. So what about my practice? Well, I have a pretty premium IOL practice. In fact, a lot of patients I operate on are pe people that I previously did radial keratotomy or LASIK or PRK on uh, back in the 90s are coming back now. My enhancement rate right now is about 1.6% for this group. And we do a lot of premiums and these are my one hour visions. So again, this group is a five to 40 diopter lens with up to six diopters of astigmatism. So it's not the easy peasy lemon squeezies, as I say. At, at the one hour visit, they're seeing 94% or 20, 30 or better. And that's kind of what some of my patients who've had LASIK before are kind of expecting. And they don't want to come back for a touch up. So if I can look at them and say 98% of you're going to walk away and I'm not going to have to alter this, I think that's a great. So this is just some iHance data. We just started putting the iHance lens in. We just had it available. I was the one of the first to put it in in North Carolina. And that was just a couple months ago. We've done close to about 100 now. And so I tell everybody whenever they use a new lens, see what platform it's on and go back to that platform before. So like when I'm looking at the Aura for these patients, I'm looking at the Technus uh, ZC Boo and I kind of look at those numbers in comparison because as I said, a lot of my patients have had previous surgery that I'm working on. We've shown this iHance lens and a lot of papers have been shown that it's a great monovision IOL, but you're gonna get about a minus a half in my hands out of that. And so if we look at the, the, the type of thing, we're just changing the power from the periphery to the center. It's not a visual thing that you can see under the microscope. It comes in five to 34 diopter lens at half diopter increments. And it comes up uh, to a, a level of astigmatism, which we're gonna run across for the most part. I think that the quality of vision uh, still for the one piece ZC Boo is better. Obviously, if you look at the modulation transfer functions, and if you look at the defocus curves, you're basically gonna get about a half a diopter out of this, but the patients appreciably notice that they can see more intermediate with this. And we're really not selling this lens as a premium IOL. This is pretty much my standard lens. I do the dominant eye first, if that's the one that I'm targeting distance. And then I say, where are you at? Give me something where you wanna be. You wanna see the shade? Do you wanna see your computer? What are you missing? And then we make target defocus based on that. The Bausch lens is another lens that a lot of people are using uh, to improve depth of field and depth of focus at intermediate near. I don't have a lot of experience with that lens. I haven't used a Bausch lens for quite some time, but I just mentioned it for fullness sake. The Vivi IOL, I probably put in about 1,500 of these so far. Uh, I'm getting about 20, 20 at distance, about 20, 20, 25 at intermediate, about 20, 32 at near. Uh, there is a visible change on the surface of the lens. And I think that using Purkinje images, you need to center that lens. It is a forgiving lens. And I think it works very well in patients with previous refractive surgery. Uh, it is limited for us in the United States between 15 and 25 diopters. So some of those patients that are higher myopes with longer eyes or, or, or shorter eyes and hyperopic prior to me working on them, maybe before, or maybe they were refractive lensectomy now are limited and I can't use this lens in those. This is a great new lens. Uh, we're about to start using it. It just came to the, the US market for us. Uh, uh, my good friend, Graham Barrett, who's also on the line, is kind of the brainchild behind this lens. Uh, it comes in a wide range of lenses from 10 to 30. Unfortunately, at this present time, we don't have astigmatic correction, but that's soon to come. Uh, there's a positive sphere collaboration in the center, which is a little bit different. Uh, but this is really a lens that's designed for monovision. It's gonna give you a true, defocus of probably about minus one and a quarter if you target Plano. And if you look at the modulation transfer function on it, you get a nice blended vision. And that's why I like to talk about bilateral vision when we're talking about these lenses, because this lens is gonna give us more of an intermediate as opposed to say an old monofocal kind of setup like I did in my sister-in-law, where you may have ZC boos in each eye and you have the one eye defocus for a minus two, two and a quarter, which is what she was wearing her contact lenses, but you can physically see her move her head to try to find her sweet spot. Well, this new EMV lens is gonna keep us from having to do that. And I think it's, it's, it's an awesome lens. Unfortunately, I can't give you any information about it because I don't have any personal experience, but I'm hoping that Graham will share that with us. 
The light adjustable IOL is great. It's 100% enhancement rate, but it's got great outcomes in terms of those patients that we touch up. So we can pretty much let them try out what they're gonna wear in terms of their vision for a couple of weeks, and then we can lock that in later. Um, I think that you can enhance these patients to their level of happy. So I think that it's, it's another step. You're, you're again enhancing 100% of these patients. And right now with a 1.6% enhancement rate, it's kind of hard to sell that for me. It adds a lot of chair time and a lot of work in the clinic, but I don't want to denigrate that technology. What about future IOLs? We were part of the clinical trial for the IC8 lens. Uh, the patients are some of the happiest patients I see. Uh, if we look at some of these defocused curves, Damien Gatnell, who's also on the line, has shown us a lot of these quality images as well. And you get good quality with the IC8. And you can target that monovision eye, whether that's their dominant or non-dominant eye, to amount minus about 0.75 diopters. They still see great at distance. In the clinical trials, we made their dominant eye, their distance eye, and we used a standard lens in that eye, whether it was an astigmatic correcting or a monofocal lens. At lens alignment for this does not matter. So if it rotates, we're not gonna lose anything. You get about a diopter and a half of astigmatism with this lens. So I think it's a great option. I think it works well. My friend Bernard Dick has shown us that in the, you know, the multiple RK incision patients, a lot of those patients are very happy with this style of lens. It reduces some of their aberrations that they have post-surgical. And I think that they're very happy. So 95% of our patients were very happy in the clinical trials. The two that really weren't happy were basically, they were 20-20 at distance intermediate near. They saw everything, but they saw some diminution of their vision in the eye that had the IC8. I always leave with this, and this is my next to last slide. The top four reasons why people are unhappy after cataract surgery is dry eye disease. Please look for it, it's simple. Use lysamine green, use an OSDI or some type of speed reading. Epiretinal membranes are about 10 to 15%. If Don and Feld will always say this, if you find it before surgery, it's the patient's problem. If you find it after surgery, it's your problem. Uh, Post-operative refractive error, like I said, in about 1.6% of my cases, I'm touching those patients up and I talk to them about it. And then it's very important. Now we have all these choices of lenses that we find the right lens for the right patient. Thank you very much.